All right, hello, uh, this is Mike and Roy from Broad Jam, and hey, we're here uh, to do a special webinar uh, with one of our favorite speakers, and that is uh, Martin Atkins, uh, music educator, drummer, entrepreneur, record label owner. Just a good dude. Yeah, good dude. Great, I mean, yeah, great, yeah. great speaker. He's, Fantastic presenter. He's going to be musician. speaking at Between the Waves this year. So we're going to give you a preview of what you can see at Between the Waves and also at the Midwest Music Expo that's happening. Uh, and, uh, and Not this weekend, but next, next, next weekend. weekend. And we're going to have special offers for all that stuff, and you're going to see those yep. in a little while. But until we get there, let's get to Martin. Let me show off my phone. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Martin, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you see me? All right. Did we lose him? Did we lose him right away? Let's uh, let's go back and into the studio. Did you lose me right? What, what's going on? Um, I can see them. Hello. No, that's fine. Um, can you text them? Can you see? Anybody Wait, in the chat? Yeah. There's 15 people in the thing. Oh, there's 15 people. Anthony. Wait, what was that? Okay. Um, I can't refresh the page without restarting the thing. So. Let me shut through my phone on just in case Mark tries to call. We can see you. We can see and hear you. Okay, so it's still going on. All right, so they can hear us, but we can't see Martin and the thing. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. So I'm going to refresh the page and hopefully it. Oh, hang it, on, everybody. Yeah, it has to relaunch. Um, we were just looking at him. Uh, it's weird. It's yeah, weird. so let me relaunch the page here and see if we have an issue. You got me? Oh. You got me. There we go. All right, we're back. And everybody's in. Awesome. All right, and everybody's in. Okay, sometimes you just got to reload to get back in. So enough of us just staring at a blank screen. Here's Martin. Come on, that was so fun. <laughs> how how are things so in fun. Illinois today, Martin? Uh, but I, all right. Somebody just said it's going to be snowing this weekend. Yeah. Yep. What a mess. Uh, yeah. I'm just looking at some routing through Denver in December. And just just giving myself PTSD, thinking about going back on the road, you know. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, for people that haven't met you before, maybe we can get your elevator pitch and to hear a little bit of the history. <laughs> um, well, you did. You missed off uh, from my introduction. You you missed off that I'm a coffee bean entrepreneur. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, but, uh, so I started playing drums when I was nine years old. Joined my first band when I was 11 or 12. Uh, started backing strippers when I was 11 or 12. Drinking Newcastle Brown Ale when I was 11 or 12. I joined a band with Johnny Rotten in 1979 called Public Image Limited. Um, and I spent some really good years, 79 to 85, with that band. We did... Uh, the first American tour, the Metal Box, Paris of Prontomps, the first live album. Um, after five years, I quit the music business um, and ended up joining a band called Killing Joke from the UK, who I also started to manage because that was a catastrophe. Um, started my own label called Invisible Records in 1988, released 350 albums started my own recording studio because I was giving all of my money to recording studios. Um, worked with Ministry on the In Case You Didn't Feel Like Showing Up Cage Tour. Uh, I've got a Grammy for my work with Nine Inch Nails on the track Wish. I'm in the Head Like a Hole video. I have a band called Pig Face, and we're touring in November for the first time in 14 years. Uh, and for the last 16 years, I've been writing books, speaking and educating in the world of music business and entrepreneurial activity. And I teach, I'm the music industry coordinator at Millican University in Decatur, Illinois, where I'm speaking to you from now. Well, that's, a, that's some kind of resume. 
Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like, I was a dude in a band. Yeah. Not quite. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite. He's got pretty impressive resume. Yes, right? absolutely. And so um, we do have, in the area, just to explain to you guys, we do have an area for questions in the bottom. And so uh, Martin's going to talk about some of his uh, tips. A little, he does presentations uh, all over the country and the world. Um, and it does. It's always interesting to see him on Facebook and Twitter. It's be like, where is Martin Atkins this weekend? And I'm usually jealous because it's always somewhere awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but you'll have a chance to uh, ask some questions and things like that when you're gonna uh, just look at the bottom of the screen. Um, and there's an area for questions. You can ask stuff there, and we'll try to get to them where we are. Um, and, you know, and also too, Martin, I want to make sure you talk about your event coming up as well. Uh, okay. And you know, and, and what someone attending that might get out of it. Okay. I've got to fly us somewhere. Na, 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 na. Yes. But thank you. Yeah, I, w I will talk about Midwest Music Expo. Absolutely. There's a section There's a section there called offers, and the offer area, you're going to find out how you can uh, get a discount and to go to Music Expo if you're in the area. And, like, I mean, Decatur's not too far away from St. Louis, right? No, no, it's not at all. It's what a couple hours, right? I think it's two hours. It's two and a half hours from Chicago, uh, four hours from Nashville, two from St. Louis. So we're actually in the dead center of the state. So it's fairly centrally located. So if you're anywhere in that in that kind of circle, um, there's going to be some awesome stuff. Roy's going to speak. I'm uh, speak so um, if you can handle that, good. you might have fun. Well, he must. Be, I, I think the barrel was really empty, so he called me. <laughs> He's like, "Is there anybody who will come to my thing?" Uh, no. So, um, but we should talk a little bit. So, a little bit about your educational experience, because you've been doing this, writing books, and teaching classes, and everything. Um, you know, for the past few years, and I'd always heard of you from the Invisible Records stuff. And growing up in Milwaukee, we hear about the industrial, you know, kind of bands that were coming out of Chicago and those kind of shows and records and things. But then uh, we, when you moved from like record guy, musician to educator, uh, when, did you, when did you move to that to being inspired to want to try to help people become better musicians and better music business people? Um, well, well, I don't know that I'm, I, I'm trying to inspire people to be better musicians. I think, I'm, I, actually I'm trying to get people to like, hey, before you practice bass for another nine hours, spend some time on the basics, get your social media right, think about the shows that you might be playing because you need to be doing five or six different things to, to make it or, or to, just, to just sustain in the business. And so I, I talk about all of that stuff. I think there's enough people talking about being a better musician, you know, but I started... I started teaching by accident. I went to Columbia College to get some, which is just up the street from, from my label, to get some interns to help me promote a tour, send out a bunch of packages. And um, uh, I did a presentation for the faculty there. And they said, great, when can you start? And uh, and I, I actually said, I can take interns now. I could put some in my car and take them back to my label. And they said, no, no, when could you start teaching touring and i i think i said what are you what are you talking about and they're like well this you're obviously doing this fairly successfully um and i thought that was an interesting opportunity for me it wasn't until i started teaching that i got bitten by that bug you know it's one thing to have somebody say hey uh, two years ago we made a baby listening to your album you know, that's kind of, uh, well, it's weird, <laughs> but it's <laughs> well, well, hold on. So somebody made a baby listening to like a Johnny Rotten record. Is that what you're saying? I guess some people have, yes. <laughs> people have met and then subsequently <laughs> married and made babies at uh, uh, pig face concerts too. But <laughs> cool as that is, it, it, you know, helping people discover what they're interested in and opening up this avenue of this exchange of ideas where I'm not just the person giving out information, which is the old style of teaching, but I'm the person facilitating a new awareness, perhaps. Um, that's an absolute drug for me. I, I love it. We had a class yesterday where I challenged the students 
to come up with a, an event in an impossible place, impossible to accomplish, and then to use their event management expertise to start to solve those problems. So um, my impossible event was a rock show on the moon, um, which gets really interesting because sound systems don't work when there isn't an atmosphere. Um, and uh, one student wanted to do a hip hop beat battle in North Korea. You know, um, so my idea of impossible was physically impossible. This student's idea was kind of legally and politically impossible. Um, and, and we just had the best class talking through how we might start to solve those problems. So I just, I love doing this stuff, you know. And well, I, think that, the, I think that's great when you talk about, because putting on shows and the music business itself almost seems to be an impossible problem. Like, because there's no real rule book, right? There's no, uh, you know, you can have mentors and things like that, but with the invention of the internet throwing everything out the window of what people knew about the music industry, um, it almost seems that the knowledge you get is in the ability to tackle those big problems and still make a successful event happen, still make a successful record or things like that happen. Um, even when you're presented with something that in, in other words, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to make this, like make this go. And it's learning those skills in classes like yours that, that seems could be really useful. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, the thing that I hear uh, is that big corporations now, the, the most valued skill set is the skill of creative thinking and problem solving, you know? So, uh, by tackling these problems um, and, and thinking around obstacles, uh, you, you just, it becomes second nature. You think about, uh, and, and importantly, you can be financially responsible, you can be organized and you can plan, but you still need to have this crazy element that shouldn't be happening, that nobody else could make happen, because that's the thing that excites people. If you do something that's safe, well, you're done for, you know, because people can see, well, that's easy. You know, I understand why there isn't a horn section, or I understand why there's only three people on stage, because they can tour in a Prius. But, but what really excites people is crazy situations like the band Gua, who uh, have ridiculous costumes there's 14 of them on the road they shouldn't be touring the accountants and the business managers would say stop let's just take three people out and a dj um, and a smoke machine and we'll make this work but it's the spectacle of gua that that's the reason it's carried on for the last 30 year is it 30 years now with gua yeah, I, think, I think scum dogs of the universe whatever came out like 1985 or 1984 yeah. so i mean they've been doing it I, that's the kind of show like you have to, it's like gallagher you have to wear a raincoat when you go to a guar show and the accountants would be like you know probably because for liability insurance reason alone you should have less cool stuff yeah. but if they did less cool stuff who'd want to go see guar Right. Or, or, or a really good example might be Flaming Lips. You know, um, I saw them play up in Madison actually a few years ago. And the thing that struck me was at every chance that somebody could have said, OK, I'd, I've forgotten the lead singer's name, um, but OK, you want 300 beach balls. What if we just do 100? And I think his response is probably, OK, 400, you know. And, <laughs> and, and it become, it's a, this amazing spectacle. And it's not like they're just throwing money into, into a pit. They're investing in the audience's delight, uh, which is something that's – look, if it's just a few more beach balls to have people lose their minds, you better buy some more beach balls. If it's that simple, it's a really easy equation to spend that money and and – and set people's brains on fire. Because once you become um, the reason that people forgot their bad day, well, that's priceless. Yeah. You know, you know, and if you're lucky enough to be the reason that 
that, you know, the album or the show that got somebody through a bad day or through a bad time, then that is, that's something that lasts forever. Yeah. You know, we're seeing that with pig face now. Um, it, it's our 27th anniversary this year. And, um, uh, and, and people will say, "Oh my goodness, I've got I've got pictures from 1993, or or I met my wife at this show, or I'll never forget another show." And the the other part that I'm still learning about about this business is that I used to think it was a two year, three year smash and grab, you know, like you've got you've got two years to make everything you're going to make in this business. And it, it kind of cultivates that smash and grab mentality. But I'm still friends with Joe Shanahan, who runs the Metro in Chicago since 1980. You know, if you told me in 1980, be nice, be careful, be less drunk, perhaps, um, <laughs> because you're still going to know this guy in 2019. You know, I would have laughed probably, but... But I think you conduct yourself differently knowing that it's a really small business, that fans that you're nice to 35 years ago will still remember you, will still support you if they're lucky enough to be around and be healthy enough to, to come out and see you. Um, this, is, this is a lifelong thing when it works. You know, that, that's a really good point, too, uh, I think you're making, that idea that it is a, a, a lifelong commitment to you're always learning, you're always trying to get better, you're always trying to make more music. We have this idea of, you know, pop music being this ephemeral thing for teenagers and kids in their 20s and stuff, and, and maybe the top 40 is, right? right. Like, maybe, yeah. maybe that's the way the yeah. top 40 right. is. But the thing is, if you're making music outside of the top 40, you can play and record. Think about those classic rock bands that played till they're dead. And some of those guys are still out, even though everybody's dead except for the drummer or something yeah, or like that. Or one of the roadies. Yeah. The name or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're yeah. still out there. Yeah. Christ, there's two Queens Reichs out right yeah, now touring. Right. Like, who'd have thought that, you know, 30 years ago, you'd be like, oh man, we don't just have one. We'd have two Queens Reichs touring all the time. You're like, what? Yeah. Get out of here. Well, and I, so, I think, go ahead, Martin. Go ahead. So we, we saw, I saw this in 2016. I, I did what I thought was going to be the very last pig face show. Um, you know, it was the 25th anniversary of the band. And I thought, well, if I don't do one show this year, when am I going to do a show? And we hadn't done a show for over a decade. And because we reached out to the fans and I put a ticket package together that included uh, coupons for the merch booth, a special t-shirt, um, all kinds of other stuff that we threw in this package we knew where everybody was. And so we put everybody as dots on the map by their zip code. It's a program called Z Maps, Z-E-E -E Maps. So you just put all the zip codes on a spreadsheet and then it comes up on a map with all these dots. And I'm like, uh, people are coming from all over the country to see the band, not from all over Illinois and, and up to Madison in, in, a, in a 200 mile radius. So then, that changed our attitude to the show. I called up Reggie's Rock Club in Chicago. We sold out the House of Blues in 2016. But the night before, I said, look, these people are coming in for Thanksgiving. We should do a dress rehearsal. And they have a kitchen there. They have a really great restaurant. I'm like, could you do like a Thanksgiving dinner buffet thing? And we couldn't afford to just give everybody Thanksgiving dinner, but the, the venue agreed that for like a $10 charge, they provide Thanksgiving dinner. And we just invited anybody who'd come in from out of town um, to come and hang out instead of sitting in a hotel room waiting for our show the next day. And I had such a great time standing in line waiting for Turkey with uh, two, two groups of people who both flew in from Vegas who didn't know each other and were just, it was just crazy. So the, the, once the bond has been formed, it's no longer about musicianship or what, it's just about family and community. And it was so, um, it was so great to do that. And that, so this time we're, we're touring at the end of the year in November and 
Um, you can buy a ticket online, but there's also a pay it forward ticket where, you know, if you're doing well, uh, not every pig face fan from 27 years ago is doing well. You can buy a ticket and trust us to give it to someone who's told us their story and, and we feel uh, we'd love to give a ticket to, you know. So we're having, we're, we're, we're doing, we're doing things with this entity we created that are, you know, uh, that are fueling to, to me uh, and fueling to the community. And it's, it's fairly serious. Once you touch people, it's a fairly serious, humbling situation to be in where you can reignite that spark and remind people of, of the power of music, really. What you say, right? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the, the, the points here that you're making, Martin, and I've heard you make this before, say these things in different ways, is that when somebody comes to your show, you know, if, if they want to hear your music, they can put a record on at home or a CD or stream it, they can hear your music. Oh, sorry about you're, that. You're, you're shaking the. Shaking so, the like, there's yeah. no earthquake here. Yeah, We're in yeah. Wisconsin. We're yeah. like 500 miles from the nearest fault line. We are getting snow, though. So. Yeah. Uh, it's well, when, when they come to their, your show, or when, when they want to hear your music, you put a record on. When they come to your show, they want an experience. They want a memory. They want something to walk away with. And just the fact that you stood in line with two groups of people uh, having turkey, I think will be probably one of the most memorable experiences for those people that they will be talking about for years. And we can't measure the effectiveness of things like that. Or a guy, you know, filling up a room with beach balls. Uh, right. You know, it, it's the equivalent of when, you know, the first time I ever saw Pink Floyd and they're floating animals over the audience. I couldn't stop talking about that for, you know, years. It seemed like everybody was talking about this tour where there's these big right. animals, uh, floating over the audience and, and uh, you know it, it, it's those little things i think when you're, when you're talking about the spectacle also but making that connection with somebody i yeah, remember that's right that's um right. this is before you paid for meet and greets at shows i remember going to see ronnie james dio or whatever and i had like my demo with me right yeah. <laughs> like not like like dio gives a damn yeah. about yeah. my band's stupid demo but i waited in line and he waited for two hours to talk to every single person Sign whatever. The, it wasn't an extra twenty bucks. It wasn't extra, yeah. it was just deals. Want to hang out with the fans? He mm -hmm. did. And then I'm like, Hey, here's you know, like that. This is cool. I love your, you know, love the stuff. Love heaven and hell. Blah blah. And I'm like, and, and he goes, Dude, I'm gonna put this in. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna play this in the bus as soon as we leave town. You know. And I'm of course he's probably full of it. But I'm like, That made you feel like a million dollars. Just that right. I it right. made you feel like. And all I had to do was say one thing. And I'm sure he says it every time to every. But the thing is. Taking that time and talking to everybody makes you feel like a connection with them for the rest of your life. Right. And that's everything. Give them an experience, of, mm -hmm. you know, not just music, but an experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and there are people who are like, if you look at it in terms of time, like, ooh, I'm tired after the show. There's so many people who want a piece of me. You should be so damn lucky. That's right. <laughs> 50 right. people want to keep you up past midnight waiting in line to buy a shirt or get an autograph because there might come a time when there's nobody in line, you know? And um, uh, I think that, you know, I'm sure in my younger days, um, you know, I, 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 I give myself a little bit of a pass because I was pretty shy. So I, and I still am, but, but I recognize that um, I need to make the effort and step outside of myself and 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 take the time to talk to people and even even if I'm not feeling so comfortable that um, I, sh I should make the effort and talk and and, uh, and and see what happens from that. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know what? Speaking of shows and stuff like that, we were going to talk a little bit about uh, how to get more people to your shows and tips on that. And I think you got some slides and everything. Um, to go over that, yeah. I'd love to get yeah. up with you. And the thing is, um, this is the kind of thing that you can see at the Midwest Music Expo or at the Between the Ways Festival um, if you guys decide to come. And if you don't decide to come, that, that's okay too. Uh, but you're definitely way cooler if you do. 
So you want me to let me just bang through some slides? Yes, please do. Please do. What happened? So uh, this 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 first slide. Um, what I'm talking about here, kind of <laughs> incorrectly, is I'm trying to tell artists that they are like a fox on a frozen lake, and that every step they take needs to be uh, gingerly taken, like they might go through the ice with each next footstep. So if you imagine yourself walking across a lake, you would test the firmness of the ice. I'm feeling like Games of Thrones vibe going on. But um, you, and you need to be very cautious with every step that you take. And the reason that this is a terrible slide is that foxes don't need to do that. Humans do because we're on two legs, but you, hopefully you get my point. Um, how do I, how do I get to my next slide? I hit that. Next. Oh, there we go. So um, here's a great philosophy. Um, Sun Tzu, never take your country to war unless you're sure of the outcome. And uh, the first time I heard this, I thought, well, that's impossible. The music business is random. Um, everything's crazy. You can't predict the future, except you can. You can look. I can look at my ticket sales now for November and know that I've personally sold nearly 200 tickets to my Chicago show and that um, uh, Denver is at 70 tickets from me. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a very small venue. So I can look at, at my upcoming shows and go, okay, maybe Oklahoma City is a large venue on a Wednesday night. I need to go to Oklahoma and DJ in the next two months, wave the flag, buy people some drinks, do an interview, do something, throw muffins at people, whatever it is, <laughs> plant a seed for my show at the end of November. And so things can be solved if 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 your strategy consists of just showing up um and then complaining when when there isn't an audience then then it's things are going to get very messy um so start simple use a landmark event in your band's history which for most bands is the release of of a record you know um uh, well, instead of releasing an album release three or four singles in a year. Um, make vinyl. People love vinyl. So now you can have three uh, single release parties in a year rather than one album release party every 18 months. Add a cause. Um, do I care about your band? No. Do I care about your new album? No. But do I care about water in Flint or, or suicide awareness and prevention? Or, or human rights in, in any form, or homeless people in Decatur, Illinois. Yes, you got me. So there's just no downside to including a cause. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody wins, I think. <clears throat> also, your communications uh, become important. Uh, whoa, something just crazy just went on. Um, add a competitive element. If you can do a band battle, um, sometimes that gets a little bit sticky because every musician, it's like little league in baseball, everybody gets a trophy. Um, but if you can navigate that whole um, who's the best uh, situation, uh, you can introduce prizes. And if you can introduce prizes, you can introduce sponsors. Uh, you know, maybe Guitar Center will give you something for, for the best band. A local photographer might agree to do band shots. It's great publicity for the photographer as well. A local studio might agree to give a one-day session to the winner. Um, this kind of stuff works really well for everybody. Real quick, Martin, an add on that for the band shots. Um, at Broad Jam, that seems to be – that's something that we come against all the time yeah. because – we can have artists with great music and audio and we want to feature it in the newsletter. We want to feature it um, on our site, like put it in ads and things like that. If it's a song of the month, if it's a number one broad yeah, jam song, yeah. things like that. So I go through 
and then I get a picture that's like of a high school graduation or their kids or their dogs. Or, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's what we get for promo. And so I can't use that for promo because I'm not going to put in a newsletter that goes out to tens of thousands of people. A picture of your dog. Like, it's, yeah. you know, just so get up and shot. And you, one of your friends has a camera has been screwing around with it for years and can eat. They probably have the umbrella yeah. with the lights yeah. on it and stuff yeah. and buy him a case of beer or take him out to dinner and get some pro looking shots and put it because that will change the amount of people who want to promote your music. Sorry. Yeah. That was my soapbox. Yeah. There. No, I can oh, give it to you. I, 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 I'm thinking of starting a new service, the, the Broad Jam Pro tune-up. You know, we'll go, we'll go through point by point. You're like, what the hell's going on with your headshot? There's a, there's a one minute intro in, in, in your song that nobody's going to listen to through, you know, what are you doing? You know, um, uh, you haven't updated this part of your profile for, for 15 years. The picture of your dog is now a RIP dog because the dog <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's just basic stuff. Sometimes people think it's this magical thing that they don't can't even fathom what to do. Right. It, it, it's 500 little things. It's overwhelming, but it's little things that you can, you can do. Yeah. Um, where, where are we at here? Uh, apply the get in free model. Uh, get in free with four cans of food for the food bank. Get in free if you wear purple. That's a Prince tie-in. Uh, get in free if you bring an instrument for the local school. That's a little bit ambitious, but everybody's got a crappy trombone <laughs> lying around. Or, or a uh, uh, get in free if you're a complete uh, uh, idiot. Um, the the White Sox do this really well. They have um, uh, flying Elvises uh, come in. Um, the Cubs have Star Trek night now. Um, uh, and Wait, the White Sox. Star Wars, Star Wars Night. Um, that's it, it, I'm just a nerd alert, real quick. <laughs> okay. Well, so the White Sox can't can't trade on their on their baseball record uh, unless any White Sox fans are listening. In which case, yeah, what, I live by the White Sox. But um, <laughs> if you can apply as much out of the box, I hate that phrase, but it's a good one. Out of the box thinking to your show as the White Sox apply to, to their alleged baseball games, then, th th then you're winning, right? I mean, to, to dream up Elvis Knight at the White Sox, it, it seems like a no-brainer because it sells out all the time. But the first time they did it, the person that suggested that was, I think, a, a, a genius. Um, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Anything that you're doing takes some time to establish itself. If you're a local band, you could start industrial third Thursdays, industrial night or, or whiskey Wednesdays or, or any of that alliteration. Just keep repeating these events and you'll train people to come out uh, to them. Oh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip some here. Oh no, this is good. Use the calendar. So, um, most days have something attached to them. I've got some examples here. Uh, it was Earth Day recently. I did an event with uh, DJs on the Brown Line, the, the elevated trains in Chicago, and didn't realize until that day that it was Earth Day. And we could have got the local news uh, involved uh, on that whole Earth Day angle. How do you get more commuters to use public transportation uh, put DJs, put a sound system and DJs on the train. And, uh, but we didn't realize till, till that day. Um, so you pick a month. Uh, the month of January gives us National Blood Donor Month, National Braille Literacy Month, National Oatmeal Month. There's, there's something going on uh, every day. Um, <laughs> September 28th is Ask a Stupid Question Day. We'll, we'll get to questions in a minute. National Good Neighbor Day, um, National Blueberry Popsicle Month, uh, National Piano Month. The school here at Millican just got 11 new pianos from Steinway. So that would have been good to do that on Piano Month. December 10th is National Library Day. Um, uh, 
festival of the souls of dead whales? Like, I mean, that's no relevance to me or to you, but I know some bands whose music sounds like a bunch of dying whales. Perfect. <laughs> Um, it's also National Lager Day, right? Um, so just find years and days and, and celebrate them. It might just stimulate. Um, uh, it might just stimulate some crazy ideas. Well, and that that, that the creativity makes things fun. Yeah. And weed day. That sounds like it's fun already. Yeah, we missed it. We missed it. All right. So no more weed. Rest of the year. Yeah. You, do that, you do that one a week later, and then you can say, well, we were going to do it that day, but we just we're forgot. Right, we're too high. Yeah. We yeah. forgot. Yeah. Um, birthdays are good. You know, um, there's, a, there's a band in Madison, uh, the Gypsy Swing Ensemble. Oh, they're fantastic. Um, fantastic band. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Chris Rupenthal, who is actually one of my students from, from years ago back in Madison, um, he told me about an event they did. Uh, celebrating Django Reinhardt's birthday. And um, uh, he got three or four other artists to do four or five cover songs uh, to celebrate Django's birthday. And somebody made a cake and it just became this thing. You know, of course, Django is dead. He's not coming to the party. But, but what, a, what, a, what a great theme, you know. Um, and that's just, a perfect niche theme too. Yeah, right. Like really, because right. if you... If you even know who the name Django Reinhardt is, you're like, oh, and you're interested in the music, you're going to be like, you know, that's when we talk about communities and stuff like that. That's one of those smaller communities. You're going to be like, hey, that sounds like a cool yeah. thing. Yeah. I, that's my tribe. I want to be part of it. Right. And and it just, it works for, you know, you find the celebration, you know, um, it's the anniversary of the release of Sergeant Peppers or, you know, you be strategic about it. Think about your fans, and and sometimes you can stretch your fans and surprise them and challenge them. Sometimes you can't, you know. Um, uh, and and you you put a celebration together, and then you approach the local promoter and say, "Hey, we're doing this special show. Will you do a drink special, or will you create a special cocktail? Print a special T-shirt. Um, you can combine two birthdays. You've got January eighth and ninth. It's Elvis and Richard Nixon, which is what a bizarre combination. You combine all ideas and mix well, and nothing is too dumb to succeed if approached in the right way. And we're back to the Prince tie <laughs> I've got some less fun but important ideas. Stay two pay periods away from a large event. So um, if, if you're doing an after party for like ACDC at some huge event, you do it that night, right? Or you do something before the show, like Breakfast of Champions, and you theme it. You do like a tailgating thing before football. You, you do a pre-event. But if you're not doing something the same day, you need to stay two pay periods away. Because the large event, it's their job to drain all of the available money in that market you know, from the market. It's the merchandiser's job to surprise you with a sparkly leather jacket that you can't live without, and it's $400, and you had to have it. And that's great, but now you have to stay in for three weeks to, to replenish your resources before you can go out and spend money at another concert. Um, incentivize early ticket buying. So we, we're selling packages right now for Pig Face in November. Um, for just a little bit more than the price of two GA tickets. Uh, we did this for the 25th anniversary show two years ago. We're doing it in November. You get two T-shirts you can't get anywhere else. You get a red vinyl 7-inch you can't get anywhere else. And you get $66.60 to spend at the merch booth. Then you also get in invited to exclusive other events that nobody else is invited to. So eight months before these concerts, people are buying tickets and talking about these events. So if you don't give people a reason to buy their tickets early, they won't. 
you can invite people using the guest list and you have to give someone a plus one so they get to bring a guest as well. That's why they talk about it on the internet, right? They, they say, uh, hey, I've been invited to the pig face show. Who's going to be my guest, for instance? Um, use flyers. <clears throat> if you're shy like me, um, you need a flyer, which I just dropped on the floor. Sorry. You need a flyer, not because of the information on the flyer, but it's a reason you can walk up to somebody and they know you're going to give them a flyer and some information rather than I'm not a crazy person approaching you in the street. I've got some information to share with you. That's why a flyer exists. Add off stage elements. Ask local retailers to come and set up their stores and give people a discount. Have an after party. Put art in the foyer. And his, his, this is slightly boring, but it's also important and people forget. <clears throat> Ticket price. I don't know anybody who has any money these days. So if you think your concert should be $18 a ticket, think again. Maybe it should be five. Um, how big is the venue? Always choose the smallest venue. That's my advice. I see bands and managers and agents all the time who convince themselves because of the potential money to be made, they should play a larger venue. But 150 people in a 600 capacity room is a funeral. 150 people in a tiny bar is a riot, you know. Create the riot. You can always book another riot somewhere down the line. Um, think about the security at the venue. Are they too enthusiastic? Nobody wants to get shoved around by a security guy. People want to be cared for at a venue. They want to feel safe. What are the bathrooms like? I've been in venues, man. Right. You know? Yeah. There's I mean, no door on the, <laughs> you know, on the bathroom. They no door on the stalls. Yeah. There's like a, uh, a, a hole trough. In the bar, yeah. yeah. Oh my god. There, well, there was times when I didn't care. Uh, now is not one of those times. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, uh, is there parking? Uh, so parking is more than just one thing. It's is there plenty of parking? Because if, if there isn't parking and you're downtown Chicago, for instance, nobody's coming. Um, if it's plentiful, how much is it? I don't want to pay more for parking than my ticket to the show. And is it safe? I don't want to get my driver's side window popped and, uh, you know, wh whatever is in the front seat of my car uh, stolen. Um, is there a good selection of craft beer? Um, and uh, what is the price? of the drinks. You know, I know venues that just gouge people on drinks prices. Uh, there's a place down here in Decatur, they'll do dollar can PBRs on a Tuesday. You know, this is these are all reasons that, that, that go together to get people to come to your show or not. And lastly, the myth of the venue. Um, think about where you're playing, the Whiskey A Go Go, I guess CBGB's back in the, in the day, the Marquee in London, places that people just want to go to. Sometimes no matter who's playing, they just want to experience the venue, like the Cavern in Liverpool, for instance. So these are all things that need to go into your choice of, of, of venue, you need to be strategic about all of that. So how is that? How was that? Is that okay? Yeah, well, that's the exact. Those, those are the kind of tips exactly that we're trying to get to people because we want we want people like to be thinking about these things when they're making decisions uh, about their music and whether it's touring or whether it's promoting their record or uh, their record. Welcome to 1960, everybody. I'm your host. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, or whether it, you know, whatever they're doing with it, uh, with their songs and the, and the tracks that they create, you got to think critically because you're trying to get above the noise. And, and that's and, and these are, even when we were just talking about touring here and live music and shows and events, um, even if you're not a, a touring musician and hosting live events, these are things that you need to be thinking about 
when you're going to be promoting your record. Like, like you said, I, I love the idea about tying it into a charity. That doesn't even have to be, that doesn't even have to be a, um, a live show. That can be if you're just trying to sell your album and say like, you know what? Half my proceeds are going to go to my favorite charity. Because what would you rather have? People buy your album? Like twice as many people buy your album and you make half the money kind of deal? Or um, would you rather have a, a 100% of less sales because you didn't attract as many people? Yeah. Right. And uh, another mistake, I see so many young bands making this mistake. I think they think if they don't hold out for more money, like this is a negotiation, uh, that maybe they're offered $100 to, to play an event and they feel like they have to ask for 175 because that's the game, that's the music business. It's like, yeah, you know what? Actually, we just offered you $100 to be nice. You're actually not worth anything. The event is going to draw people whether you're playing or not. And within that negotiation, they've just lost a chance for $75, you know. So the, I'm not saying everybody needs to play for nothing. I'm saying if you're strategic and smart and you're good, I don't think it hurts you to play for nothing once or twice. Because if, if the club owner sees that you have an audience, that you're attentive, you've got some good T-shirts, and you're not just – looking at that one show to line your pockets because the difference between a hundred dollars and 175 isn't going to line your pockets anyway. But if you're good with your audience and you come back and do that again, by the third time, well, the ball starts to be in your court. Maybe the venue owner is like, Hey, you know what? My Wednesdays are kind of dry, light, not many people are coming in. Do you want to take every third Wednesday to do this, to, to bring people into my bar. So you don't lose by giving. You just establish that you're worth something and then you can leverage that. It's, it's not a short-term uh, negotiation. It's a longer-term um, situation for sure. And I see that same problem with uh, what's called the hospitality rider. I think a band thinks they need a bottle of Jack two bottles of wine, you know, the, like the, the, the quantity of alcohol on their rider or the crazy things on their rider establish them as a bona fide artist. And too much, too much crap on your rider is a reason that the show won't happen again. Uh, right. Or, or it's the reason that the, the venue will have to charge $2 more for your ticket on a Tuesday night, and now people can't afford to come and have two or three beers on a Tuesday because you've got a dressing room full of tequila and Doritos and other crap that you don't really need. You could go and buy from, from Walmart for much less probably. No, so it is um, – I do think that, that bands should decide as they go in, like, if you have to have a certain money to make to feel comfortable or something like that, or you have your minimum, like, okay, it's not worth it. Or so you don't want to be like bitter about going or hate going. But I think people, if, if you're doing something because you think it's what's to be done instead of what you believe or whatever, or you're doing it yeah. to put on an appearance, then the only person you're hurting isn't that event. you're not sticking it to the right. man. You're sticking it to yourself and your potential audience. Yeah, you're jabbing yourself right in the eye, you know. I think that that um, gigs in the first three years should be looked at as an investment, not as an opportunity. It's, it's an opportunity to meet people, put people on your mailing list, uh, have songs uh, fail miserably. Great. You don't need to record them then because nobody likes them. Um, record the songs that people like. But – but, but you're starting any business, you have to invest in the beginning. You know, a, a pizza parlor gives away pizza in the beginning, you know, and, and it has to be good, you know. And maybe in the short term, somebody thinks, ha ha, I got another slice of free pizza out of this new restaurant. But if it's good, one week later, two weeks later, somebody's sitting in their office going, oh my God, I would kill for a slice of that pizza. Bam, you win. If your product is good and people know about it, and that's the hurdle, you win in the end. 
Now, now, did you say, Martin, um, I heard you talk about email lists before and like, was it not to charge for songs or to not do a full out until you had an email list of a certain size or a contact list of a certain size before you're going to start selling? I don't know about that one. Okay. I, th I thought, I, I just remembered that you had a certain thing. It was like, when you have 2,500 people on your email list, that's when you should try to sell your record or something like that for the first time. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know. No. All right. I was, I, was, I was kind of going into that building your community first before uh, you, before you're sitting there and, and going for a sale, make sure you have enough people that give a damn before you well, do Right, but but here's the, here's this really amazing thing. If you build community first, that community will forgive you for releasing a crappy album because they like you, because they know you. You know, if if it's all down to the music, um, it it has to be absolutely amazing. Plus, you need to reach out to the community anyway. Um, you know, to 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 start that relationship. Once you, if you start the relationship first, then people want to come on a journey with you. It's actually kind of cooler if you make a couple of missteps along the way, because those those first two, three, four, five, ten thousand fans want to feel like they're on a journey with you. Like, wow, I'm pleased they've got the live show together and they fired that crazy bass player. It's all coming together now. And everybody feels that, uh, and everybody supports you in that. So, um, but I, I, I definitely think community first. Yeah. Well, and speaking of communities, uh, you know, somebody did have a question earlier uh, about networking, and so let's let's go that real quick because we have a couple of great opportunities uh, for people to network in the Midwest uh, in May and in June. And so uh, Doro asks. Um, how do you network successfully without making yourself a nuisance? And uh, I think we've, I've heard you talk about this before. Well, so uh, there's a difference between just talking with someone, um, having something interesting to talk about uh, will be the first thing. And it can't be your new album because lo and behold, surprise, surprise, it's not that interesting. If you're a musician and you've got a new album, it's like, yep, everybody does, you know. But if you also fish, bake, play chess, carve uh, things out of bones, I, I don't know, I'm kind of I'm losing my mind. But, you know, if you do something else that's interesting, you could strike up a, like a, a really great conversation. and. Uh, I've been in the, so, those situations at, at, at events, and if somebody doesn't just jab me in the face with their music, I might ask for it. You know, if you're jabbing me in the face with your music before I've asked for it, it's kind of an imposition, you know. So um, there's there's networking, and any kind of conversation is is a two way street. You're not just telling somebody about what's cool about you, which might not be as much as you think. Um, you're asking other people, like, "Hey, how's your day going?" You know, you know. You, did you know there's a there's a great coffee shop around the corner? You're being helpful um, and 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 productive rather than just trying to sell your shit to somebody. Well, you want to. I think what you're saying, Martin, is give them. Give them a reason to like you. Yeah. Give them a reason to come back or to, you know, uh, if you're, if you're pitching your music, give them a reason that uh, to connect with you and, and open the record and listen to it. And if you're not there, make sure, as you said earlier, the package is just as engaging as the record that the outside of all the things they're doing leading up to listening to your music. It, it's an engaging experience. But my favorite, um, so we were down in New Orleans at a convention down there. I, I've forgotten the, the name of it. And um, uh, somebody called up to my room. I was, I was up in my room for a bit. They're like, you've got to come down here and meet this guy. I'm like, oh, oh here we go. Yeah. And here's this guy uh, in, in a pair of overalls. And he hands me a jar of honey. He said, I've got 80,000 bees in my back garden. I'm like, that's amazing. Do you have a demo? 
<laughs> and so I, I accepted the jar of honey and he gave me the, the demo and, and, and that's it sometimes, you know, you have to differentiate yourself from everybody else. So how are you doing that? And if it's just being a good musician and just having a good album, that's okay. But you might want to think about some other things just as a person, you know, you might want to have some, some other things going on just for your own sanity. I think that it helped me succeed as a drummer by not always having my drumsticks in my back pocket. You know, um, sometimes I'm just happy to make some scenery for somebody or help in another way. I actually installed a shower to help a band with their album. You know, I was able to do that. Having more skills makes for more interesting stories, I think. You know, and, and that's, that's right. If musicianship is all that it took to uh, be popular, then the top 40 would consist of like jazz musicians and progressive metal guys. That's right. You know, but when's the last time you heard a prog song, you know, in the top 10? Uh, so there's got to be some context around it. And there's things that people like and that they enjoy. And there's a reason they enjoy the music because they connect with the people uh, who are creating that music instead of just connecting with the, you know, the 12 tone, the 12 semitones yeah. and stuff like that on a, on a recording. Right. I mean, and they do this even, even in the world of athletics now. Right. If you watch the Olympics, it's it's not just about who's the fastest. Oh, I mean, it is, <laughs> but but on the NBC coverage, it's like, and here comes this guy. He lost his house in a flood, and his brother is I don't know still missing. But let's see how he runs. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's all it's, people are interested in the backstory. They made a movie about Eddie the Eagle. <laughs> Like he did, remember Eddie the Eagle, the, the British ski jumper? Yeah. Like he he came in like 57th or something, but he had a cool story. And so like in the 80 or when was it was in 1988 or whatever, he was the, and, but then 30 years later, they made a movie about it. Oh, on the Jamaican boxer team. Right, yeah. right. The Jama oh my goodness. They didn't yeah. know like, so there had to be, imagine the guy who's like Mr. Bobsled, who's just practicing every day, right. who's, it's like a minute faster than the Jamaican bobsled team. They're just elbowing him in the face <laughs> to the Jamaican bobsled team who are just not that good. It's, it's not, it can't just be about that. You can't be crap. You can't be terrible. Yeah. You know, but, but once you're, once you're pretty decent, you've got to start adding more things to, to your skill set. You know, those are, those are great points. And, and that's why we do things like Between the Waves and the Midwest Music Expo mm -hmm. to help you learn stuff like this. Also, uh, you know, Doro, to help with your networking too. So the, the whole point is you're going to come to this event and you have a chance to talk to other musicians. And if you feel awkward at Between the Waves and you're like, I don't know what to say, I don't know, come up to one of us and just start a conversation. Yeah. Now, I'll listen to you for 30 seconds and then try to ignore you and walk away slowly kind yeah, of thing. Right. <laughs> but uh, in that 30 seconds, at least you can practice. No, yeah. what I mean is th these are the places where you can work on your networking yeah. skills yeah. Yeah. in low pressure situations because you're with other musicians who are all trying to do the same thing. The only reason they're there is to get better. So don't, you know, wear a cool outfit or something like that too, but don't worry that you have to be the coolest person in the world. Just be the nicest and see where that gets you. Yeah. And, and just be in the room. You know, I've taught myself when I was younger, I've taught myself out of going to all kinds of things, you know, because I'm shy. You know, Pete Townsend asked me to go to his mom's house for dinner. I'm like, oh, no, don't be silly. I'll see you later at this gig. And I met him later at a gig. And here I am, 35 years later, still kicking myself because I could have gone to dinner at Pete Townsend's house. And and if you're shy, you're probably doing that to yourself. And, and you're right. I go to a lot of these events. I was telling somebody yesterday. So South by Southwest, for instance, is a yardstick. It's the shining star in, in conference events. 
but there's probably 5,000 things going on. And that doesn't make it a better event to me. You can only go to one event at a time, you know? So uh, these, these kinds of events are great opportunities to be in a room with a couple of hundred people and uh, approach people and talk to them. You know, the last time I was up in, um, in Madison, I think I forget the name of the, 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 the Avet brothers were on stage and they disassembled some songs that they'd written. And I sat there thinking, this is just magical, you know, to, to have a window into someone's creative process. And I know you have, um, Butch Vig is going to be doing a presentation yeah. and, um, uh, what a great opportunity to attend. You, you, you're not a hundred yards back in, in a room. You're close to the action. And um, uh, it, it's a great opportunity to absorb this information and then meet people afterwards. That, that's right. That's right. So well, but the thing is, so Doro, uh, what you're going to want to do is check out the offers page here. And if you're watching this later, like on YouTube or you're watching it on the Broad Jam webinars page, um, we're going to have links there where you can check out the Midwest Music Expo. Use the code BroadJamRocks uh, for an in incredible discount. And then also for BTW Between the Waves, come to use the code Atkins, like the diet or the guy. <laughs> and you can use that code and you're going to get uh, like 35 bucks off the VIP, $20 off the thing. So you can attend it for, you know, $49, something ridiculous. Yeah. And if you're a student, um, it's you know it's, it's even it's even cheaper. So that's the idea. We're trying to do things uh, to get you guys out there to network, to meet other people, to meet other bands, and you'll find that when you meet other bands who are committed and in it to win it, and those are the kind of groups you want to play with. Those are the kind of people you want to work with because they're out there networking. If they're here networking, that means you play a show with them. The chances of them promoting the show you play together is high as compared to playing with the bands who don't even bother to bring their girlfriends. Right. That's a, it's a difficult, if it's a difficult thing to navigate that um, sometimes it feels like we're in competition with other artists. If, if you're coming up and everything's a struggle, it's difficult, but the best thing you can do if you're on a, on a show with three other bands is promote those other bands. Believe me, they will notice. And six months, three years down the line, you'll get an opening slot with a band. You don't know why. And, and somebody will say, yeah, well, uh, we were struggling at the time. We played together three years ago and you really went out of your way to promote the show. And it really got us through a difficult patch. You have no idea the difference you, you could make in someone's life and into someone's career. You know, um, you just need to do it. So we got a couple of questions here before uh, we'll let you go, Martin. First of all, one from uh, Ty. And his band, Lords of the Trident, uh, power metal, a lot of fun. They're, they're going on a European tour in September. And it's their first time band travelers abroad. Uh, wonder if they have any tips. First tip is don't have any felonies, right? Well, yeah. Um, any, any thoughts from a guy who's been there and done that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, don't don't try and sneak any merchandise into the countries that you're going to. Um, it will probably get confiscated. Uh, you need to have merchandise manufactured by a fan would be great over there. You could try shipping some merchandise in advance over to Europe, but the customs, um, you might think that they're idiots, but they're not. You might need a carne to list all of your equipment with the serial numbers. I'm not, that is within Europe. I'm not sure if it's from the USA to Europe. Um, oh my goodness. And my question is, why are you going to Europe? Which is it's a little bit late if you're already going, but um, hopefully you're going because you have fans over there. There's some larger events that you're involved with and don't miss the opportunity to think about the people who aren't at your show. So I know that the Lords of the Trident are very popular in the Midwest. So when you're in Sweden or Berlin or London, um, make sure that you're, you're uh, streaming, you're sending postcards, uh, signing and sending postcards to your fans back home and making sure that when you come home, you're, you're, 
you're creating more reasons for people to love you even more. Five tips. Um, good luck on that tour. Uh, keep no uh, Christopher Mele, uh, or Meal, I don't know how to say your last name, but Mele makes it sound like a fight, so right on. Um, what are your thoughts on working with a promoter, say, for a themed festival, for free year one, but then year two they expect to book you again for free, just because who's the douche here? The band says no thank you on round two or the promoter for attempting to exploit the band again. Is it too much pride of the principal? When does trying to, quote, get in the door, unquote, start hurting your brand? Meaning other promoters finding out you're cheap, they talk. Is there a balance there? Well, Stike that one. Well, it's, so this is difficult. Um, it's up to you to exploit the situation. So if someone's putting a festival together and exploiting you by putting you in front of 3,000 people, well, how are you exploiting that situation? Uh, is that the day that your EP comes out and everybody gets a copy? Do you have a QR code behind you so anybody who scans the code gets a free copy? You have their email address. So now you have the data, which is the most important thing. Um, do you have flyers for your next show? Hey, we love you. Everybody gets in free to our show at this club downtown. So now you fill a club downtown based on this audience that somebody else has put together for you to exploit. And now you're taking that and creating your own reputation for yourself at a downtown club. And you can tell a downtown promoter, we're going to come and fill it. Uh, actually, you undersell, over deliver. Um, next time, we need a piece of the door. Now we've shown you we can fill this club on a Tuesday night. Um, we need 80% of the door next time. Um, once, once you've established your, once you have an audience, you can take it somewhere. If you don't have an audience, then who's being exploited? I don't, I don't understand that. Just, just because you set up and play on stage doesn't mean that you're worth anything. If, if you set up and play on stage on your own in a venue, and nobody shows up, you're not worth anything. I'm not saying as people we're not worth anything. Your band, your entity in the music business isn't worth any money right now. You know, I, I think that's a fair thing to say too. It, it's, it's important to remember that um, we have to, you think about the realities for everyone involved. And, you know, at a festival, it might be your, um, I remember the first time uh, you know, talking to the guy that booked Summerfest in Milwaukee, and he's like, oh, well, of course we keep track of the amount of beer that is sold during when each band plays. You know, and I was like, oh, you know, because I'm like 23 or whatever, and I'm like, but what about the art, man? And he's like, art's awesome, but we, I mean... We exist because we sell beer. Right, you have, you have so, you have hundreds, there's 100,000 people at that festival with 30 different bands playing at once. How, you know, they're going to pick the bands for next year based on how do they make the most profit because that's how you keep going and that's how you create amazing experiences. It's not a charity. Right. And, but there are still good people in, in all businesses who, you know, there's, there's bands that they want to see too. And they'll say, well, we're going to pick out of these 30 artists, 25 of them make sense for our bottom line and our business and our sponsors we get to pick five that don't actually fit, but we want to help them because they've helped us in the past or, or for whatever reason. Or they're artistically fascinating or they're, you know, just, you know, it, it, that's also what keeps the festival exciting. Yeah, right. a little like, I would never think I'd see this band here. Well, okay. You know, that's, that's what makes it fun. So all right. uh, we don't want to take too much more of Martin's time here because he's generously donated this time uh, to talk to you guys about helping uh, your music careers. And we want you guys to make sure you check out the Midwest Music Expo. That's coming up in a week and a half. And if you're uh, anywhere near Decatur, Illinois, um, you should try to be there because you're going to have a chance. Roy's going uh, to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, Martin's going to do a presentation, of course. There's going to be some other great speakers. And Martin, where can they find – you can click on the link in the offers – but just in case they forget or somewhere else, where can we find more about this? Uh, it's MidwestMusicExpo.com and code MX2022. 
MMX 2019 gets you in for free. Right. So that's it. I mean, either MMX 2019 and you get to go for free uh, to the Midwest Music Expo. So, like, take advantage of these things while you can um, because uh, this, it's awesome that we have music professionals here in the Midwest that want to work with independent artists and stuff like well, that. And I want to say something too, Mike, that the, I was, I, uh, I spoke down there, I guess it was February, if I, if I remember right, Martin, and, and there was, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 people there. And it was a, the, the school, Millican University is an, is an amazing place. I got a little tour uh, from Martin and uh, what they've done to try to promote the arts within the school is just uh, fantastic. And it's just, uh, I love that campus. I love the venue. And obviously having Martin there. Uh, yeah, that doesn't hurt, right? That doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. That's for sure. So, He's made it happen. And the thing is, uh, okay, let's say you can't make it to Decatur next you know, week. You're like, oh, no, it's Mother's Day or blah, blah, blah. I don't even know where Mother's Day is. I mean, I love you, Mom, but I don't know what it is this year. Um, so Thank you. It's, okay, great. Make sure you remember that. Okay? Great, I'll write that down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so make sure you check out. You can watch Martin's presentation. It's going to be Sunday, uh, June 9th at Between the Waves in Madison. Uh, and you can check that out at a, at a sweet discount. Last, I used the promo code Atkins, A-T-K-I-N-S. And you can attend that. And we'd love to see you all there. Let's do some networking. Let's work on your music career. And um, let's help everybody be more successful because – the, the better bands that come from the Midwest and come from our area, the cooler we all look. That's right. So uh, we're, not, we're not in competition with each other. We're in competition with the world, the economy, the climate, depression, everything that's, that's bearing down on everybody. That's the enemy, not other artists. We can all help each other, and, it's, it's, and everybody wins. We, you know, if one person wins, somebody doesn't lose. We we help each other, and everybody wins. It's glorious. And if Martin, if they have a question for you, and they want to follow you, like on Twitter or Instagram or places where they might be able to uh, be in communication with you, where can they do that? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Martin M A R T E E E E N four E's, just like the old days. That's an '80s drug joke. <laughs> All right. yeah, on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll, uh, you can bounce around. I'm Flowers Fight for Sunshine on Instagram. So, uh, yeah, please make sure to check out Martin there. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. We look forward to the Midwest Music Expo next week, and we look forward to seeing you between the waves. It's nice to talk to you guys. I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you later, excellent, Martin. excellent. Sure. And for Bye. the rest, and for the rest of you guys, uh, if you have questions for me, Mike at Broadgem.com. If you have questions for Roy. Roy at broadjam.com. And uh, we'd love to help you out and help you with music licensing, music promotion, and all those kind of things. Everybody, have an awesome weekend, and uh, keep rocking. See you guys.